it is widely acknowledged that oil and gas ventures carry inherent risks, particularly for Uganda, which is navigating these waters amid a global shift towards green alternatives. So every country, um, even when you invest in the oil and gas, the fact that it's a global, uh, some of, most of the things are determined by the globe, for example, the price, you cannot anticipate correctly or exactly what the price would be. But it also has uh, other risks because we know that as a country, we, have, we are at a point where we, have, we are producing our oil at a point where other countries are transitioning from fossil fuels. So that also presents a risk because um, as a country, we have invested in oil and gas, but what if, what if we do not get back the revenues that we have anticipated as a country? <laughs> Analysts suggest that fossil fuels will play a significant role globally, with rising demand reaffirming the market's viability. Other countries have moved stages, uh, they have moved quite uh, steps ahead. They are moving away from uh, use of uh, fossil fuels, for example Norway. Uh, but there are so many, so many, the majority of the countries still have uh, a long way to go. A long way to go to completely go off. Oil and gas is pretty much still a very important factor in Uganda's energy mix. We shall still continue to see a growth in the consumption, in the demand of petroleum products within the short, medium and even long term, within the visibility of what we can see until at least up to 2060. We are likely to continue seeing a growth in petroleum products. Despite this optimism, perceived risks loom large. Given all that is happening, when we see banks pulling out and other financiers as well, what, how do we prepare ourselves? Can we make some real serious analysis and modeling to see whether there is a risk and how can we plan for it? Energy transition involves identifying how to enhance the efficiency of technologies, broaden support, innovate financing models for affordability and accessibility, and enact policies that facilitate its adoption. It's not a choice. It is no longer a choice. It is a mandate. It is an obligation for countries to go green. It is not a choice. Those who are still thinking about our traditional way of cooking, matoke, it's not a choice if you want to survive. The biggest challenge we have is that this transition is too costly. To an ordinary person is, what does it cost to put up a solar panel for one barb? It's almost half a million. Just one barb. But that barb won't help you to do bigger things like you want to put up a fridge, you want to have a TV in your, in your home to get information from government from everywhere, you want to, to iron your clothes, you want to do fumigation, you can't do all that. Just one Bible for lighting, more than half a million. So what does it take to build a dam? Billions of money. What does it take to set up a solar program that can power one million households? Huge, huge amount of money. So it is so expensive. The green is inevitable because the other resources are not only going to be extinct at a certain point in time, but also place a very serious burden on, 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 on the environment in which we derive meanings. The message is very clear. Humanity has to transition to clean or green energy. However, the challenge that lies ahead is how to ensure a just transition, particularly for countries like Uganda, that contribute the least to climate change and yet suffer its worst impacts. Dennis Igor, for UBC News.